Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Walker Art Center. I'm Amanda Hunt, uh, Head of Public Engagement, Learning, and Impact here at the museum. We are thrilled to welcome you to our third and final uh, part of a series of talks called Abundant Cities. Um, thank you for being here. Thanks for making this happen. Um, to our partner, R.T. Ryback and the Minneapolis Foundation, Megan Leafblad, my partner in crime, to the artists, creatives, architects, thinkers, movers and shakers who have participated in this conversation. It has been enlightening, energizing throughout, and tonight will be no exception. So tonight we're centering the conversation on building common ground. Um, I won't spoil what's to come, but what we wanted to highlight were real world examples uh, that we might look to in consideration of the future we want to build in Minneapolis. So we've got incredible people here tonight, Witsi Asoko, Jason Foster, Scott Kratz, and of course our event moderator, Adair Mosley. Thank you for always being with us. Um, we will kind of expand on bios after I come off the stage. Um, and with tonight's focus on Minneapolis and cities and place uh, more broadly, I do want to ground us in the acknowledgement that we are on indigenous land, uh, that this is contemporary, traditional, and ancestral homelands of the Dakota people, uh, and we still live in community with them today. So I want to honor and acknowledge that as a part of gathering in this place tonight. Without further ado, I would like to welcome R.T. Ryback, our former Minneapolis mayor uh, and president and CEO of the Minneapolis Foundation. Uh, we built this together with the help of many wonderful people. David, I see you. I'm missing the trio tonight. Um, R.T. will share a few words and an exciting announcement. Again, thank you for being here. Please welcome me and joining R.T. Thank, thank you, Amanda. When we wanted to do this program, we recognized there was only one partner that we would want to have, and it's Walker Art Center, and Amanda's been incredible with Megan and the whole team here. But in this room, big ideas have been brought. There have been great performances that have inspired and disturbed and changed our perspective, and so many other things in this room. And we felt this would be the appropriate place because it's a moment of reinvention for our community. And in previous moments of reinvention, this city has looked at crises, it's looked at challenges, and it has come up with ideas that are bigger and better, and the city emerged a much stronger place. We want that same thing to happen at this moment where so much is in flux, but this moment is different. This moment is especially important to have that innovation be inclusive, to have it bring everyone in the community along, and for it to really recognize the fact that we don't have to imitate a bunch of other cities. We can steal a few good ideas from them, but we have the capacity in this community to really do big things. So the second most important people here tonight are, is gonna be this incredible panel we have. And by the way, um, can we give a pre-round pre of applause to Adair Mosley, who's moderated this and is such a great community leader. They are the second most important people. Now, people at podiums often say the most important person is you, and I'm a washed up politician, and you may think that's rhetoric. It is actually, because the goal that we've had from the beginning is to create a movement for significant, inclusive, dramatic, and inspirational change in our community. That doesn't happen with people on a panel. It's inspired by that, but what we need is each of you to become an advocate for this work. You'll look at a QR code on the back of the uh, flyer you got coming in. That's for you to present your ideas. And we are very serious about not only having those ideas, but finding a way to have the ideas that come from you and from the panels uh, become reality. We've hired a really incredible team. David Frank, I see up there, Sarah Harris, Beth Shogren are part of a threesome of people with great experience uh, making things happen in this community. We have charged them with taking the best ideas that come from these, presenting a report on what it will take to make each of those ideas happen, and then through the Minneapolis Foundation, we will uh, publish that report, get that in people's hands, and then lean into the idea of making this happen. 
The forum has already inspired some great things, one of which I'm really happy to announce today, uh, Artie Zimmerman, who, uh, the wonderful writer who is a great friend of both this institution and the Minneapolis Foundation, has been inspired by this work and said that what he really wants to do is to help make sure that other great projects take place in this community. So Artie's uh, late husband, uh, Lars Peterson, many of you know, is one of the really wonderful and beloved architects in our city who very sadly died a couple of years ago. So in Lars's honor, Artie is going to start a $25,000 a year annual prize for the best new idea and design or other forms of livability that make this community better. I thought it was such a great idea that the Minneapolis Foundation is going to match that with another $25,000. There are a number of my board members in the room. Just close your ears at that, guys. It's a good idea, honest. But, um, but so we will have this $50,000 prize this coming year to uh, award to a single project, but hopefully be part of the ongoing inspiration of the work going forward. So you are very important in this audience and our hope and honestly expectation for you is we cannot move this community forward in the innovation and inclusivity that we need without your active participation. So we wanna have your ideas and have you lean into making them happen. With all of that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Adair Mosley, who uh, currently leads the African American Leadership Forum also had incredible success at Pillsbury United Communities, and I could go on, but the bottom line is that Air Mosley was the very first name we came up with for this, and we're extremely excited with what he's done and what he's going to continue to do. So let me turn it over to Adair, and let's get rolling. Good evening, everyone. So great to be with you all in this third, but not final, not final, not final conversation because so many wonderful ideas have emerged and I see some familiar faces that have been with us through all of the series and so um, you too have um, been inspired. I do want to, before I introduce these esteemed guest, uh, acknowledge two things, that um, we happen to ironically be a panel of all self-identifying males. Um, and so I want to acknowledge that that is not lost upon us. We've had some powerful women that have been a part of the dialogue. And so due to scheduling and makeup, this is what we have this evening. Uh, but I like to call out the things that are quite noticeable. The other thing is that um, while, we've, while the theme has been inclusivity and while it has been building a city for all, We've also acknowledged that we acknowledge that most of the audience has been white throughout all three series. And so I do think that that's some reflection back on us as, uh, as leaders about ways in which we can make sure that we get to this conversation, everybody. If we're talking about building a city back for everyone, then we need to make sure that all the voices are heard as part of this process. And so those are the disclaimers for this evening as we open up. Uh, I have learned so much in my brief period of time with these wonderful folks, and I will start with the person who is currently sitting in Los Angeles on our screen. Uh, but we have the um, privilege of having Jason Foster, who previously worked with community partners and residents um, at the nonprofit River LA to grow civic pride and social responsibility for the surrounding Los Angeles River, and is now president and CEO of Destination Crenshaw. Uh, next in line, we have Scott Kratz, who has worked in D.C. with the Ward 8-based um, nonprofit Building Bridges Across the River for the past 10 years, developing a one-of-a-kind civic space supporting active recreation, environmental education, and the arts, and local, local, wonderful artist, Wit uh, Siasoko, is a Twin Cities community-based visual artist and is a two 2021 and 2022 Jerome Fellow, um, whose work falls at the intersection of art and civic engagement. So please join me in welcoming these three wonderful folks to the uh, stage. Um, we've uh, so many, so many creative ideas have come up on, on ways to re-engage residents and all of the possibilities. A lot of the conversation has certainly been centered on downtown and thinking about, A, how do we bring people back to its core? How do we think about um, reuse 
Um, and so many wonderful ideas have come up around, you know, uh, turning buildings into um, to helping us solve for our housing crisis that we have, and how might we support BIPOC um, entrepreneurs in storefronts, and so so many wonderful, credible ideas. But the work that's represented up here on this stage, I think, is a little bit different because it gets at the heart. It starts to talk about how we restore, rebuild, and re-engage those that have been left out of the narrative, and they are doing it in such intentional ways, and recognizing that even though that this arc is long. Um, they are trying to make sure that uh, we see and write ourselves into that future and the residents that they're serving. So I start this evening, um, if they each could, 30 seconds, talk about your work, just to make sure that people understand the photos behind us um, and the work that you're leading on the ground, and then we'll go into a dialogue. So let's start with you, Jason. Cool. So, so thank you, Adair, for, for that introduction. Um, and sorry I couldn't be uh, in person with everyone today. Um, I, I work for Destination Crenshaw. Uh, Destination Crenshaw is a 1.3 mile cultural infrastructure project on Crenshaw Boulevard. Um, it started as a community led project uh, in response to transit development. Um, and so there's an there's a at grade portion along Crenshaw Boulevard uh, where community members really wanted to make sure that the transit construction benefited the community and didn't actually spur the displacement that so many people fear uh, in Los Angeles and throughout the country. Um, and so this organization started around 10 years ago with conversations, one-on-one -on -one meetings and the such, um, and is now a nonprofit executing a capital campaign of over $100 million to build pocket parks, community spaces, public art, um, and support the small businesses and artists that have made Crenshaw Crenshaw. Uh, in hopes of being uh, a source of permanence uh, for the residents as well as pride um, and a hopeful aspiration that we can kind of be, you know, supportive of Black LA into the future. Thank you. Scott. Uh, so my name is Scott Kratz. I'm the senior vice president of Building Bridges Across the River. We're a nonprofit in the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., and we are partnering with the District of Columbia government, the DC local DC government, to transform an old aged out freeway into a new park, um, the, the 11th Street Bridge Park. Um, <clears throat> it is perched over the Anacostia River, and anybody that knows DC knows that the Anacostia River has divided the nation's capital for generations. It's divided it by race, by health outcomes, um, by income, housing prices, sort of every way that you can imagine it. And so this idea, I think, that most viscerally connects with local residents is to create this space that can bring together residents who otherwise wouldn't normally connect um, is key. It's been informed by over a thousand meetings with local residents um, that drove every single programming element, even selected the design team. Um, the Much of our work is how do we put that decision-making power back into the hands of local residents. Um, and finally, um, it, it's become so much more than a park. Um, because it's it's really critical to make sure that these thousands, tens of thousands of residents who've helped shape this project from the beginning can be the ones that benefit from it. So we've had a series of anti-gentrification, um, the strategies that we call our equitable development plan that has housing, workforce, small business, uh, arts and culture strategies um, that to date have invested over $86 million in the local community that nearly matches the amount of money it's going to cost to build the park, and the park isn't even open yet. So looking forward to the dialogue. Hi, I'm Witsi Asoko. I'm a community-based artist, um, public artist here in Minneapolis. And I use the arts as a tool to talk to people, to convene people, and hopefully it leads to civic action. Um, I've had many of experiences with the, the Walker Art Center. I worked here for quite a, quite a long time. Um, doing youth programs and outreach and also at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. But like the most important um, title that I have is artist and it it plays a role in being a trickster. It frees you of many, many different restraints and hopefully um, artists can can in help people envision um, different futures. And I, I, I would I question why I'm up here and I love Jason and Scott's work. Um, I've done some concrete projects, but I think I'm more here to talk about the one-to-one -one and the relational. Like, how do we meet people on the street? How do we engage with people where they're at? And, uh, you know, thousands of surveys, like how do we do them, right? 
Um, one other reason why I'm up here is because I, I was, I'm a co-founder of City of Skate. Skateboarding is one of my passions, but it led to a, a Venn diagram of overlap where finally my interest in public art and art and also um, skateboarding all came together in a space. And I see Felicia Perry here, uh, West Broadway uh, Area Co Coalition. Um, and with Juxtaposition Arts, we created this um, a skatable art plaza. It's a multidisciplinary space in North Minneapolis. Um, its primary um, use is skateboarding, but it also brings together lots of people from the neighborhood. And it's a, it's a place to, you know, to convene and to lead to that civic action. So um, I'll give it back to Adair. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for, for um, a wonderful opening of your work. Um, t tonight, um, where I really want to center a lot of the, most of the conversation on is actually not on the physicality or the concreteness of actually building something, because that's relatively, if you ask me, relatively easy. You have the resources, the money, you can pay the best artists and architects in this room right now to actually build you something. But your work all is demonstrating, and, and there's words and keywords that I'm picking up on, restoring that pride and dignity, activating that agency. And if we don't do that, if we don't center that in our rebuilding efforts, then this will we will have done it all for nothing. So one of the one of the questions, and this is pretty big that um, any of you can you can tackle. I've gone across the country and I've asked this question because we are at an inflection point. But I'm curious from you all, what does this moment need from its leaders and institutions? As you think about the moment that we're in, because, and, and, and to the folks that are in this audience, what does the moment need from its leaders and institutions? Because I believe you all have had to answer that call. Oh God, it's a big question, Jason. I think, I think, I think, um, so I, I'll jump in, but I think we were modeling what we actually need, which is more people to take a step back um, and allow space for um, the everyday person to step up. Um, and so, you know, I think my role at Destination Crenshaw is really organizing um, not only the community, but the stakeholders at large to actually understand and know their roles and and really grow the pride of the ordinary person, right? Um, you know, I kind of think about Destination Crenshaw as a Crenshaw destination first. We are making something explicitly for our residents. Everyone else would benefit from it, of course. But what is Destination Crenshaw if our anchor grocery store is still not there? What is Destination Crenshaw if we're still a food desert? What is Destination Crenshaw if we still have um, low attendance at Crenshaw High School, yeah. right? If like, so I think what we're trying to do is actually create a project that spurs other conversations, but ultimately creates the foundation for our fundamental rights as people in this community uh, to be better. Um, so I talk about it as an infrastructure project only because those are quality of life conversations that we can actually address and we can and we can be direct about. But that's because, you know, if we're talking about community ownership, everybody in the community owns their sidewalk. Yeah. Everybody in the community owns their public right of way, right, as, as citizens. So that's how we can actually talk to each individual person is actually working in that way. So we model, we lead, but ultimately we lead from behind and allow the residents to actually, you know, dictate change. Lovely. Please. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah right? I'll build on Jason's comment. I think a hundred years ago, you know, there, uh, when crises happened or when we were thinking about deep planning, it was, you know, a handful of people that were meeting behind closed doors and making all these decisions, right? Yeah. Like that, the decisions we're making today are going to last for the next like 20, 30, 50 years, right? We're, we are at this inflection point um, and it needs to be from the ground up. I mean, in our case with the 11th Street Bridge Park, you know, we, we, we didn't come, sometimes what happens with these projects, you, you come in with the bright, shiny pictures, right, that's 95% done, and at that point, you're sort of asking for what color should the chairs be, not like, yep. you know, truly sort of community engagement um, the and community direction. And in our case, we took several steps back and saying, should we even do this, right? Like, is this even something that the community wants? And only through, you know, we had those first two years, before we engaged a single architect or engineer, we had over 200 meetings with faith leaders and, and local business 
business owners and and elected leaders and um, you know the matriarch on the corner and and that's that's cr critical and at every single step made sure that it was the community that was driving that right. So much about this work, and I think this is going to be a through line um, the, throughout this larger discussion, is about trust and working with communities that have a justifiable, enormous trust deficit, right? Because people have come in and made a lot of promises that, that haven't been fulfilled, right? So we need to make sure that, that by giving that power back to the community is one, not the only, but one mechanism to build that trust. There's so many, so many things to riff off yeah. of, but as far as institutions go, it's like, I, I had a relationship with this place and I worked with students here and it's like, after I left, there was a gaping like hole, like they don't know anybody, they don't know this institution. So one, getting people involved in civic engagement where they feel like they, it's not just relational, they know the process enough. Um, the other thing is, is like, I see here in Minneapolis, like just an uh, acknowledgement of the landscape um, what exists already and what should be supported, and then bringing that into the larger projects. I mean, I think things like May Day, which we've somewhat lost, and it's sad, or Bare Bones Theater, or Art Shanty Projects, or Intermediate Arts, all of these things. I, uh, Yeah, there's there's a ton. Nor flow, yes, yeah. flow. So there's so many institutions. I'm just speaking through the arts lens, but these are the things that need to be supported, right? It needs to be acknowledged, and it also, you're going to say funds, right? Obviously, a one-time infusion of funds is great, but like an ongoing, like long-term commitment to programming, not just to start it up, but just a, you know, a 10-year, 20-year window versus just like a, a one-time hit. Thank you. Yes, please, please. The panel appreciates when you clap and you give responses back. We know that we're, we're on the right track here. Um, it, so two, two things came up as part of this conversation. And Jason, I want to pick up on something that you said in uh, a theme, but I think all of you can answer this question. Um, so much of our dialogue has been about uh, building a city, especially our downtown core, uh, for those that live outside of our city. And we tout the numbers of visitors that come into our city. While I think that's an important metric, it's not the only one. And I think something about you all, the, especially the 11th Street Bridge Project, Destination Current Site specifically, and what you do in terms of placemaking, this novel idea that we should actually be building our cities for those that inhabit it. And so I, want, I would love for you to talk about why you centered the residents and the people first, that it, it, it's really that outsider, and as we think about our downtown core, as we think about other critical infrastructure that's going to get built across our city, have we truly centered the person that lives in this city? And why has that been important as part of your work? So so what's cool about that is that I've been watching Scott work for almost 10 years now. Um, so I could actually tell you a long view um, of, you know, watching from the outside and watching them do that and also going to Howard understanding exactly what that means to that community right um and and knowing that it's actually happening right um and then on the destination crenshaw side you know our project was started by the council member who represents the area but not when he was a council member he was a nonprofit leader um and he was doing traditional organizing trying to understand you know what to do about this like the train is coming what next um, and then, you know, once you build a groundswell, people, you know, kind of designate you as the person that's going to run. I mean, that's how organizing works uh, in, in some sort, in some sort of way. Um, and I think that, you know, it really shows an organic nature of, you know, why these projects happen and also why the orientation is the way that it is. Um, you know, you talked a little, you talked before about not having uh, a, a woman on the panel, but, you know, Black feminist, uh, you know, philosophy says if you work for the least privileged, help out everyone along the way. Um, and that essentially is what we're doing, right? If we focus on the people that don't have it and create resources for the people that have it, everybody else is essentially going to benefit from that change, from that improvement. Um, and then you don't have to debate around gentrification, displacement, what's going to happen next, because I'm explicitly creating something for you. The conversation is about you, right? Because ultimately, if we create something and people don't believe it's for them, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what it is, right? How many times have you seen Black owners of anything purchase something and 
re you know reimagine a space but it looks nordic yeah. it has the steel aerial fonts mm -hmm. and then they're like why doesn't people like it yeah. it's because you you recreated the ikea of the community right like you actually you actually created by weaponized design a way in which to signal that you are with the change that's not for them. So that's why you engage artists from the community. That's why you engage creatives from the community because ultimately we're not one thing in Crenshaw, but if we create a multitude of expression through our black artists and creatives that actually show that there is something different for our future possible, then that's how we actually speak to them. That's how we actually speak to the spirit of the community and, and involve them in the change. Jason, I have something to riff off of that. I mean, I. I've been involved. I'm a muralist as well. You might see one of the murals up there, but like um, in my neighborhood, I won't name the neighborhood, but there's a corridor, a commercial corridor that has been vital to this neighborhood for a while now. And, you know, the, I talked to, there's recently a mural initiative that happened along this corridor and I benefited. I painted a, a mural, but like I was asking the question of like, what is the metric for success, right? Like, what what is the outcome of this? And hard pressed, no answer. But like, I'm not putting it on that project, but it's just indicative of of, of a larger plan. And uh, I was pushing them. I'm like, how many immigrant businesses do we have along this corridor? How many, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color businesses do we have along this corridor? And what the metric should be? How many people keep and benefit that from that space. Um, yeah. So I, I pose that as the metric and I think that that, that, that is where it should be. That should be the lowest bar. Um, and I mean, it, Adair just called me a, a place maker. I hate that term. It's place, okay. place, place, right. place, place, place keeping. It is, keeping. you know, you Next know this, yep. but like, you, yep. yeah, it's, it, it is, uh, language does matter. And I, I feel like that's, that's what we need to focus on is keeping, keeping those businesses there and, um, in particular, if they're immigrant or black or indigenous or people of color that own those businesses. And then we got to talk about massage, murals as facade improvements for those yeah. business owners because yeah. they don't really care about the mural. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we got to talk about both. We got to actually make it work for the people that have been there. Um, and then, yeah, you can paint something on it. Right. Um, and I think that 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 speaks to creating multiple solutions that actually see more than just one cut of your community. You got to see them all. And I'll riff on what both of you two said. I mean, two of the questions that we spend a lot of time thinking about is, you know, who who is this park for, and who's going to benefit? Right. Those are those are two relate different questions, but related questions. And so certainly thinking about um, the driving every programming element and selecting the design team and, and the community, a group of local stakeholders selected all of our art. Um, but it's also widening the aperture for these types of projects. And this is something I know Destination Crenshaw and Jason's leadership's done a lot of work with as well. Like, who's going to build these, right? H how do you sustain these jobs? Who's going to work there, right? That how, There's so many different, there's a hundred different things that when you go into a space, that tell you consciously and, and and unconsciously whether that's for you or not, right? And like, and if you go there and it's ref and you see the people that are working there, like the rangers and the directors and the staff that re that look like you, that's one, right? Um, the if you go to a park and they're selling like twenty two dollar mahi mahi tacos, right? Like that sends a very important message about like who this nothing against mahi mahi tacos, right? But like you know if they don't have like affordable food options, right? That so you you um, the it's 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 critical, but it's also critical to make sure that like we're having these conversations really early and really intentionally like so often you hear about um, these projects that say well we want to hire local as you're putting the shovels in the ground like that's not the time to have that conversation the time to have that conversation is years and years of, in advance to ensure that the local residents has the skill set and capacity to apply for and succeed at these jobs right yeah so yeah. like we just graduated our 27th construction training program, right? We haven't even broken ground yet, but we have 150 East of the River residents who are now in construction jobs. So in the GC, when the general contractor comes to us and says, well, I can't find any local residents to hire, we can be like, well, here's a list of 150 people that are currently in the construction trades, like try a little harder, but you need to be thinking about this again, like really early and really intentionally. And I know this is something that Jason's doing a lot of work on not just workforce development, but deep preservation on preserving the businesses that are there and the culture that's there. You're, yes, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> 
one of the things, and, and Scott, you're touching on this, that I was so impressed by when I came out to visit the 11th Street Bridge Project is that, yes, you have not broken ground, but you've really been intentional about thinking about the stabilization of a community and the, knowing that you're going to put a significant amount of resources and that those resources will have a ripple effect that could, uh, and so you've weathered the community against uh, that tension, right? You've made these investments. And so can you talk about the intentionality, not only these workforce development programs, but the entrepreneurship and all of the compounding things of you've made equal amount of investment of actually what it's going to cost to build the land bridge? Yeah, um, we, I mean, we've seen, we've seen in, a, in many of these projects that um, the, you um, particularly transformed infrastructure into parks projects that um, the, they can have, they're, they're beautiful, they're wonderful, they're amazing, but they can have huge unintended consequences, right? I mean, projects like this have increased property values by 100% plus, right? So um, we sort of saw that and saw, it's interesting, early on, we um, hired in a firm to do a traditional economic impact analysis. Um, the to sort of justify city involvement and and they came back with a um, statistic that like really um, was a catalyst certainly for me that these kind of projects can increase property values anywhere from five to forty to sometimes a hundred percent and I and to me I thought like whoa hold on like just stop right um, what can we do to think about this work again early intentionally and centered in the community so we spent a year in 2015. Um, working with local stakeholders to come up with key strategies around four key areas, housing, um, the preservation of black-owned businesses, workforce development, and arts and culture strategies to, to be making these investments well in advance of, of the park opening. Because once once the market, I mean, we live in a, for better or for worse, we live in a capitalist society. And, and once those markets start to move, it's going to move so much faster than we could possibly respond to it. So, you know, by the time the park opens, we'll have been investing in these strategies. And I'll mention just a few. We've for a decade, um, the, we've stood up a community land trust. So we now have the Douglas Community Land Trust that it's own separate 501c3 that has over 232 units of permanently affordable housing. We've seen 122 Ward 8 renters become homeowners who have gone through our uh, Ward 8 Home Buyers Club, capturing intergenerational wealth for a neighborhood that has 75% renters at greatest risk of displacement, right? Um, and we just were launching on Saturday. Um, this is so cool. I'm so excited about this. Um, <laughs> we, we've commissioned a local architect, East River Architect, to create a mobile small business kiosk that eventually will house black entrepreneurs on the park, but... We're impatient. We don't want to wait for the park to open. So we're launching it this weekend. And we have seven <laughs> amazing we amazing women entrepreneurs who are going to be in this um, kiosk, like building their brand and and um, the and making sales and sort of building wealth, right? So it's not one of these strategies, it's sort of all of these strategies in, in a larger comprehensive way. Um, the but again, early intentionally and with the community at the center. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's just so powerful that you're not just asking for the dollars or brick and mortar, right? But you're also equally asking um, corporations and foundations and philanthropic investors to make to in these intentional strategies that are going to keep people in place and to thrive. And so you're being upfront about that. Um, I want to uh, shift us a little bit, um, and I'll because we have an artist, and, and thematically in all of your work is the um, is uh, artists are centered as part of the work. And so I would love to talk about uh, the creative economy and intentionally on focusing on artists and the role that they play. And we've had, I think, a missed opportunity as we thought about the reimagination of our spaces of not intentionally including artists and for them to be the direct beneficiaries of the things in which get built. And so can you talk about, A, why that's important and how you are, how you are centering artists as part of your work? I'll take this yeah, first one. Yeah. Since uh, yeah, I identify as the as an artist, um, I I think this is a complex question. I mean, what Jace, Jason was saying, you know, the murals should come after the facade treatment, right? And I tread lightly on this because I mean, I am a community based artist. I can't just drop into Crenshaw. I can't just drop into Washington D.C. and use my magic to do the the place keeping things, right? These are all one-to-one -one relationships and really trust, right? That's that's where it has to exist. And a lot of planners that I've worked with, I do trust them and maybe to a fault <laughs> in, in some kind of way. But, um, you know, the, the, I've, I've had four we studios. We all do. <laughs> I've had four, four studios in the last eight years, you know? So who, 
who's to say that I'm not the gentrifier, right? I'm a brown person. So I can't absolve all artists from with without like any 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 kind of repercussion, you know, or any kind of um, fault in it. So I don't have the answers. Aside from that, I move at the speed of trust and I've asked the hard questions up front. And, you know, there's the kind of accountability to me being one to one and getting 400 interviews on Rice Street. And you're only, you know, I ask them as a representative of the city of St. Paul to talk about sidewalk, you know, like the sidewalk, oh, um, yeah. you know, length. But like they want to talk about public schools. <laughs> they want to talk about, you know, safe uh, grocery stores. You know, they want to talk about businesses, you know, and as somebody that's being genuine as a person that has to like go out there as as a person that represents government, I like want them to be accountable for their actions as well. Like you ask the question just because it doesn't relate to your sidewalk or lighting. Do you have a duty to this to this answer? Right. Like these 400 people that didn't talk specifically about the sidewalk. But like, how do we get that information to the public works people or like to the to the school system? You know, government sees themselves in these silos, but we need to be able to have like a clearinghouse of information where residents like you know, if we're talking, if you're, if they finally have had trust within the government or like have trust with civic process that we honor that, that, um, that conversation. I mean, so I could not have said it better than myself. Uh, uh, we have a branding problem with democracy. Um, if we've noticed, uh, in the past, the WPA, encouraged artists employed them and we got out of a depression um you know i think if we weren't you know in the capitalist society we would be able to understand that our depression right now is morally and it's spiritually um and so engaging an artist to again get us out of that is what destination crenshaw is doing we are employing a hundred artists to actually reimagine the spaces in Crenshaw, being from Crenshaw, working in Crenshaw. And those are business owners, right? Like these are people that are artists, but they're also business owners, right? So we're we're actually engaging in a workforce development program for the central or uh, for the creative economy of Crenshaw. So, you know, we're doing the work, but we're also conducting a study uh, with Otis College. Um, and civil economics, who are economists focused on the creative economy to understand our economic impact as Crenshaw District, uh, because we know that the chief export of Los Angeles is black creative capital created in Crenshaw. So if we do a traditional economic development impact study, it's not going to capture the experiential marketing expert. It's not going to capture Issa Rae. It's not going to capture Nipsey and what he's still doing today, even though he's passed away. That's right. right. So we need to be able to understand that so we can advocate to our actual number. Right. So we can advocate to an actual number there that that shows our intrinsic value. Right. And and, you know, that only acknowledges the radical nature of actual black equity in space, right? Uh, Because it's never been accomplished. So to be able to get the community on board with actually going after that, you got to show it all, right? (laughs) Because they know that traditional economic, oh, a thousand jobs created. No, that's not. (laughs) That's not what we're doing in Crenshaw, right? We got a whole network of networks that are created off of what's happening here. Um, So yeah, we got to see those numbers and we got to actually acknowledge the artists by giving them the commissions and the jobs and the, and the opportunity to be seen as businesses and what their impact actually is. Yeah. Beautiful. There's uh there's been conversation of saying, give the, give the police department to the grandmothers. Let's give the civic, uh, the, the reimagination of our cities to the artist. Um, and I think we will all be better because of that. Uh, Jason, in our last conversation, and, and Scott, I'd love for you to pick up on this and, and you as well, Whit, you, you struck me with a line around um, uh, that, you, yes, you're building this wonderful, this destination point for the residents of, uh, of Crenshaw, but you are also wrestling with the tension of progress and what that looks like, and uh, even with the, the, those that live there. 
And so can you just say more about this, this, this creative tension, this tension that we have as we build towards better, um, what, what that creates and how you've um, been able to, uh, you know, have conversations and dialogue and move beyond that. And, and Scott, if you could pick up on that. Yeah. So I think, you know, one of the, one of the tensions that I have at Destination Crenshaw is working at another project for eight and a half years before I came. Um, so I was working with the river in Los Angeles, uh, incredibly affluent project focused on kayaking and other great things. Um, and so I learned about all these, uh, all these things like the Scott's vulnerability index and all these other data analysis around like how this could possibly impact the community. And then I come to Crenshaw and none of that conversation is happening. Nobody is thinking about it. And so all the fears that are happening in Crenshaw today are valid, right? Because they need to actually understand that this thinking is happening and can happen for them, right? So I am battling with the speed of trust, <laughs> you know, um, of trying to get our community members and trying to get our business owners on board with actually, you know, doing the change at rate of speculative real estate which knew about the rails construction in 2011, right? So really, if it, it, my, my success as Destination Crenshaw is actually a flag, right? It actually shows like, oh, this is where investment is safe, right? And so ultimately, we have to create solutions for the residents explicitly because it has to be where nobody knows. Right. It has to be something that is internal to us in our own secret menu around how we get to our own success. Right. Um, and so in creating a black project, it's really what we've done to be resilient. We have developed our own language to speak to each other. We develop our own ways of being around each other so that we can speak non verbally in spaces where we know we shouldn't be. Right. And we're doing that now. <laughs> right. We're doing that now through the project, we know the economic impact of putting black art in the ground in space, right? And we're benefiting off the fact that no one else does, right? Because we're sending a signal to each other saying, don't sell your grandmother's house. Keep going to this business, even though it might be tough, fight through it. Um, and, and, and really, you know, buy a house here if you care, right? Um, and so we're sending signals out for all of those things, knowing that we have a finite amount of time. Um, and so that is, you know, every day for me, the struggle is, am I moving quickly enough, but also am I communicating thoroughly enough to the legacy business owner that the future has not been great for, mm -hmm. that has struggled for years, right? And so we doubled down today in our facade improvement program uh, our, our CDFI partner wanted to give the money directly to the business, which I was great with. But ultimately what that did was, is it gave them an opportunity to not follow through. So instead of doing what they did, which is just call and see how they're doing, I called a black GC and our DC staff, and they went to each and every business. Like, where are you? How are you doing? Do you need somebody to help you bid? Do you need somebody to help you do this? Do you need somebody to help you do that? Yeah. That's what you have to do. You have to continue bringing them along, but that's expensive because now I have to pay for that black GC, have a scope to continue doing that. So I think what we're doing is, is we're actually showing the true value of engaging permanent projects, right? So Scott can tell you, it's not inexpensive to do what he's doing. It's actually more expensive, yep. but it's a better use of our public dollars if our public projects actually engage like this. It creates jobs, it creates buy-in, and it creates pride and trust in our community for the things that they're gonna get. Yeah, I think the answer is, the answer is not not to invest in these neighborhoods. Like the residents of Anacostia, have the exact same right to have a have a waterfront that's as beautiful as the neighborhood of Georgetown, right? In Washington, D.C., to use like D.C. as an example. But 
The answer, the, but but again, we need. I keep coming back to this word: is thinking about this intentionally, right? Um, which is the reason why we've been doing all this equitable development work. But it's interesting because we're we're now in the process of creating our third version of our equitable development plan. This has always been, you know, our last equitable development strategies date back to 2019. A couple things have happened since 2019, right? Um, they've gone through the pandemic and you know a host of other things. And and but we're having an explicit focus on policy, right? This is an area that makes nonprofits really nervous, makes me really nervous. But if we're looking at a billion dollars of economic development that's, that's coming east of the river in the next five years, a billion dollars of economic development, right? Our $86 million that we've been able to invest in the neighborhood is like, it's really important and it's really great, but it's kind of a drop in the bucket. If we're really looking at getting, if we're really looking at getting into the, uh, addressing the systemic reasons, the systemic racism that's been baked into the core that has seen an 81 times difference between the average household wealth of black families and white families in Washington, D.C., 81 times, right? If we're really That's looking crazy. at, if we're really, it's crazy. If we're really looking at getting at that, then we, we need to we need to adjust the policy, right? So with each of our strategies, we're actually creating a, a, a suite of policies um, the and advocating um, the to, count, to our council, to the mayor. Um, and several years ago, um, we, 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 we started a larger program um, that we're, we're super proud of. It's been really impactful. It's called our Community Leadership Empowerment Workshop. So it's 30 hours of training, of working with local residents, working with local readers, leaders to, to enable them to be more effective change agents. So it's part like how to run a meeting, how to de-escalate conflict, how to build consensus, but it's also how to how to demystify the planning process, right? Because if you miss that random Tuesday city council meeting, like um, the where somebody votes on something, like you know you're you're you've missed the station. So we actually brought in um, the the head of Georgetown's urban planning program to like come in and say, here's where you can make a difference. And these graduates, we've now just graduated our fifth clue program, is what we call it, um, have done amazing work. They've they've run for office. They've won. They've start. They've quit their jobs. They've started new businesses. They've they've now taken their own clue. And now we're doing a train the trainer program where they're training their fellow teachers and their their fellow nonprofits. And it's amazing, right? So that's what I mean. Like when we have to be opening up the, the much larger these kind of app, these this kind of uh, aperture for these types of projects. I want to. I just want to kick it back to you because you're the moderator, but I'm going to take it over as a moderator because Adair at Pillsbury United. No, 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 no. no. I, I'm going to ask you the question because I, I think I think your experience. I'm the Minneapolis. I, I, I'm one of the Minneapolis representatives, but Adair here is it has been with was with Pillsbury Pillsbury United Communities. And the same question goes to you. I mean, your incredible projects with Pillsbury and what you're doing now. Um, we should hear from you. <laughs> So answer the question. <laughs> well, part of I'm, I'm stalled because I've transitioned to the next question in my brain, <laughs> so I can't remember that question all the way. Um, Artists are subversive. Uh -huh. Artists are subversive. That's my that's my role. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, and so uh, now I'm caught off guard also. But um, I, I do think that uh, as we this question of kind of this this tension of progress. Um, is something that we're we're battling, and I will center perhaps North Minneapolis in in that conversation, as we think about uh, light rail infrastructure that potentially is coming down the corridor. As we think about, um, I don't think as a city, um, and all of the public institutions have been intentional about um, ways that we could make critical investments in and around um, this potential infrastructure. I don't think that people will argue if we want to be a growing city then um, we do need good public transportation infrastructure. That, that's, if we want density, that makes sense. But at the same time, we have to, the, the acute thing that's in people's face is, where is my business and what is gonna happen to my home? And we are, um, we've had so many examples across our country and in our own backyard, if, even if you look to St. Paul, where we could actually be getting it right um, yet we're missing the mark on just how do you bring people along as part of that storytelling and narrative. And I think you all's work demonstrates like how do you truly bring a community along? How do you um, recognize that their distrust in the institution um, is real because something has happened, something is triggered that moment? And so um, one of my questions back to you all too was that um, I, 
we oftentimes say we have, we've done these many community engagements, meetings, great, now we can go build. But it's ongoing and it actually never stops. Um, as a leader of Pillsbury, uh, um, the staff would get so irate with me because I had access to the, uh, for North Market when we built the grocery store, I had access to the social media account. And so everybody that sent a complaint, I saw and I responded to directly and told them my office is on 36 in Fremont. And if they said they wanted a product, I called the store manager and made sure that the product was there the next day. And that those types of engagements that people were like, it's so proximate, right? Mm. And every day we're listening. So I'd love to know from you all just like how it does, even beyond when these things get built, how it does, it's iterative, it continues, it's not done. How do you continue to listen to community and evolve the work? So back to you. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, I mean, my obviously my project that I worked on with juxtaposition arts, I'm not the only person that created the space in City of Skate and so many others and the youth that designed it. So we're looking at juxtaposition, skateable art plazas. You know, there's it's it's a quality facility. It's a tiny postage stamp, but kids from all over the region come to skate this Thing in North Minneapolis, and that is not the that's not the metric, right? It's not the metric. I want to know if TJ's there or if Dennis is there or Willie's there, and I come to find out that they're actually going to parks outside of North Minneapolis all the time. <laughs> they're kind of tired of juxta, but that for me, that's the metric, right? Is like, are they sparked enough to try something new? Are they sparked enough to love something so much that it takes them away from their own neighborhood to go someplace else? So, like, um. You know, that's that I can't talk about it in terms of a, of the two gigantic projects that you, you all are working on, but it's that relational one to one and being in space. Right. Like it's like you don't just leave that space. I go up to Juxta. Uh, I went to Juxta last week and skated. You know, that's still a relationship to that place. And this is three, four years down the road and um, still a special place to me. And I know that's how I can check in and make sure that it's it's still going and it's still a valuable asset to the neighborhood. And I think the uh, d building on that, like showing up is so key. And that, that was the like the thing that just ripped my heart out during the pandemic, right? Where, you, where it was so much harder to show up. Showing up on Zoom is not the same thing as like hanging out in historic Anacostia and you have these great sidewalk conversations of like, hey, what about this? And have you thought about that? And like, um, but thankfully things are sort of reopening up. Showing up is key. Like we, for the last, this Saturday, so anybody's in Washington, D.C., you're now invited uh, to our ninth annual Anacostia River Festival. It's a huge event, right? bring several thousand residents down to the festival down to the site but um the it's an opportunity for us to listen right um the it's it's making sure we're building in this sort of constant feedback loop and trust is about shared experiences over time right and so um yes they're about these projects but ultimately they're with people and that's where i think that's where i think so often nonprofits can play we were talking about this earlier yep. but that nonprofits play this really unique role because Folks who sometimes are in government like cycle through and they get to the next thing and the next thing, but then you miss that sort of that personal relationship, right? Um, and sometimes those nonprofits can have, I mean, people change too, but can have that sort of long, longer longevity. And finally, I would say what's really critical is making sure that, I mean, half of the staff of the 11th Street Bridge, 11th Street Bridge Park um, the, were born and raised like east of the river, right? And what that means is like, that's not performative. That What that means is that that fundamentally changes the conversations that we have internally, right? All the time. Like, sure, we're out there engaging the community, showing up community meetings, doing all of that, but it's it's really critical. Um, the And just in December, you know, I um, we gave a promotion to one of my staff who sh to become deputy director, and her explicit job is like, you're going to be running this someday. She's the third generation Washingtonian, right? Um, the So it's being that sort of of intentional of, of um, making sure that voice is also on the inside. That's great. So uh, in our last few questions here, this is going to be lightning round because I have so many things that I, I want to be able to cover uh, that um, we need to discuss. And I think the audience needs to hear from you all. Um, I would love for um, Scott, perhaps you pick up on this and maybe Jason, this is in your wheelhouse as well. But we oftentimes think that we have to spend uh, the $50 million uh, on the project, right, to then activate it. And you've talked a lot about, and I think this Riverfest is a great example of normalizing the experiences long before um, the park is actually even open. Can you, A, talk about 
ways and intentional ways that you're actually getting people to experience it today. The other thing is this role, this thing of like prototyping and ideating, like it's foreign in like public institutions, I think, but how the ways in which you all are doing that, you're spending low fidelity, maybe medium fidelity around the work before you actually make the investments of tens of millions of dollars. Yeah, I think that I, I've uh, discovered that magic word of pilot, right? And that, that we can, that, and particularly, and this is, a, I'll build on my previous comment, that we as nonprofits can be a unique role. Um, governments can do lots of things really well. Taking risks is not always one of them, I will say. Um, the And I say that with like um, great respect for uh, my public colleagues. Um, and so we as nonprofits, like if we fail, like that's okay. Like we can learn from it. We've done, strat we've done some strategies that didn't work out and that's okay, but we can then learn from them and then sort of move on. And this, you know, this um, small business kiosk that we're calling the Bridge Spot, the community voted on the to name it as the Bridge Spot, that's, is a great sort of opportunity, right? Like, like it's a it's a fairly quick intervention. Um, the that every month there's going to be a new black-owned business east of the river, and then we're going to be moving them around sort of the city. And and most importantly, it's to give them sort of um, you know and we're connecting them with um, some pro bono support from Accenture. So ex we have these amazing consultants who are coming in and providing pro bono wraparound service for each of them. Um, the but. For us, it's it's really critical because then when we open the park, like in three years, you know, we don't want to say, okay, we're ready, black entrepreneurs. Hello, hello, anybody? Is anybody out there? Right? We built this deep bench, um, the um, for in, in a way that's not too expensive to try and test and pilot that. So I would the suggestion I would say, like for here in Minneapolis, is like, yes, these are important moments that we're in, but don't be afraid to go out and like test and pilot these things. They're they they sometimes do not need huge investments, but all of those incremental investments also help you build trust with the community and demonstrate action. Your your work collectively as you know as we think about these wonderful things that you're going to stand up and include artists across it but it's bringing three things to, to mind it's that it's a, it's about access but attachment and agency. And at the at the end of this is you all are really trying to ignite um, recenter uh, share in that power that the redistribution of where power actually sits and activating that agency. And so that's just wonderful. Jason, um, while, while you're here, uh, it, I would love to know, um, you said something so striking to me on the call around, A, tell folks how you got to your values, because I think that's so powerful and how you had an iteration around that. And just the role that um, narrative plays in our rebuilding efforts, because I do think that narrative has been a, an important thing um, as we how we talk about ourselves, how we see ourselves on the other side of you know all the things that we've experienced as a city and a society. That that's so funny because you know I am such an iterative person that um, I probably have a different way I got to my values today. Um, but uh, I am a um, a person that has been affected by this myth. Um, and of my parents' displacement of a house that I had in Knoxville that I grew up in. Um, so that's my orientation to this work. And ultimately, the path that I'm on right now is trying to figure out how do we see that for black and brown people who have made a bunch of right decisions in a row and they still are impacted. Like they still have nothing that they can do about it. Um, and they have to live in the communities that they're in. So when they get better, we shouldn't make them leave, right? Um, and I think that that's, you know, how I'm trying to take my frustration um, and turn it into a positive thing and create something um, and, and not be actually, you know, held down by the frustration. And, you know, that's why I moved from affordable housing to where I am now, which is infrastructure and forward facing. Um, because, you know, I'm not going to resist this big giant boogeyman or woman, uh, that's called the banks angelism. <laughs> um, and as a finance major, I know that that's a, a daunting thing for nonprofit philanthropy to try to solve. Right. Um, so what I want to do is actually try to create another solution that utilizes all the tools that we have, um, in our toolkit, um, to create a better future for black people in space and I'm working for myself. I live in South LA, so I need to get it right. Um, or my kids are just going to be visiting us, uh, you know, or, or visiting a place where they use it, uh, like I do. 
right? Like we got to, we got to do it. We got to grow where we're planted as the project says, and we're, we're not trying to leave. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. Uh, and I, I'm going to, uh, prompt you on one thing though, on what you said around moving your value from community to care. And I would love, Oh to, yeah, yes, there, we go. there you go. Uh, would love for you to tell people why, why that mattered. So, I mean, I think, you know, and I, and I love the fact that you brought this up because we're, we're literally working on this right now, uh, from our comms team's perspective. Uh, we have three, three, um, you know, kind of our manifesto or our logic around our work. Um, it's, it's culture. Um, it was community and it was creativity. Right. Um, and so I pushed our comms team to actually substitute community with care. Right. Because ultimately if we did the culture and the care and the creativity, um, the community is understood because we actually care enough to actually do the work. Right. Um, and sort of, modeling that after the ethics of care and thinking about the difference between justice and the ethics of justice and the ethics of care, it's being attentive. It's being a person that is actually ethical around the care that they have in our search for justice, right? It is not a right or wrong answer to create a destination for black people. We're not having that discussion. What we're having is do we care enough to actually go at the speed of change that we can stand as a community? Do we care enough to create the solutions that are needed to create the permanence for our people? And do we care enough to involve the people that should, right? And what that means is, is that we can actually push people past the zero sum of justice to caring about each other because ultimately, if we do our job, then they don't care about who comes and visits, right? because I'm here. Your visit is not moving me out, right? Your visit is actually making my move better because my cousin has a job or my uncle built this over here or I can show something off that I created myself, right? And so that's the ethics there and we're gonna involve that in our way of speaking but also in the way that we do our work because we have to manifest who we are as a place, as a geography through this organization. And that's something in the culture that we're building on our team, but also in the way that we're actually engaging our residents and, and our artists and everyone, right? Like everybody, they, they will not wonder if Jason Foster cares, right? Um, what they will wonder is how we're going to actually do the work <laughs> because they can actively wonder with me, right? And that's a way in which we can actually move forward that's honest, right? I'd rather be as the carer than the person that knows everything because I don't. Um, and I think that that is the honest approach. And that honesty is what we need in society. That's what we need in community, right? Um, and I think that vulnerability is something that we can all kind of gather around. Um, so, 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 mu so much rich knowledge has been dropped on us here this evening. Um, and you all, uh, while I maybe you all presume that we were going to just talk about how do you get these things done, right? I think, um, again, I think that those things come pretty easy and we have a, a plethora of folks who know how to put bridges across rivers. And, uh, but the, the core and the essence of what you all are doing is um, th this attachment and again, this agency and this care. And if we don't tap into that in our city in Minneapolis, then ultimately, um, we'll, it'll be continue. It'll be void, um, and we will continue to see the same people who have shown up show up, and we truly won't have fostered inclusive spaces. So, in your final remarks, I would yes, Jason, are you coming in? Please, no, oh, no, 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 okay. no, 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 no. All right, no gotcha. go, All go, right. ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You made me think about something, but it's perfect for the final remarks. But you get to. You probably get to say it. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, we're we're going to open up the the audience for some questions, direct a few questions from the audience. But I would love for you all is uh, to what is your what is your letter back to the city, your your dear Minneapolis? What is the thing in which you want to impart on us um, around as we think about uh, the reimagination of, our, of how we come back um, as a city, how we rebuild our spaces to be more inclusive? How do we center the people? Um, 
especially those that have been pushed to the margins. Jason, so you don't lose your thought, we'll start with you. Yeah. So, so what I would say is, um, you know, I lost a uh, a classmate to police brutality um, in high school, um, and I am not alone. There are a lot of Black people who have lived that um, long before media or anyone else cared. Um, and what I would say is that Destination Crenshaw is a reparative development project. We are repairing the relationship to the community, um, each other, um, and we have to acknowledge grief. We have to acknowledge grief in our change that we're creating. Uh, we have to acknowledge grief in the things that will no longer be there and the people that will not be able to come with us. Um, and so the heaviest part of our work is that acknowledgement, but also the repairing um, that we have to do collectively to embrace the future that we have. Like we have to do these things. Um, and you know, that's something, that's how I fell in love with this project when they started talking about that. I started really researching reparative and researching um, what that meant um, because I know I need it. Um, and so I think it's, it's really a letter to the city that you're not alone. You are every space in the country. Um, so anytime you feel like isolating yourself, know that you will be in isolation together with us as we try to all collectively build a space together. Thank you. Um, I'd say three things. One, don't be afraid to widen the aperture as you think about these projects beyond just the beyond just these sort of construction projects as we've been talking about, right? Um, don't be afraid to put that decision-making power back in the hands of local residents, residents who are here, right? That that's who you're doing this for, and have the confidence to get started, right? Because building on Jason's comment, like we're all in this together, and I can't wait to um, see what we can learn from you, what we can learn from Minneapolis as you move forward, and and we're there for you. Just hearing what Jason had to say, I, I have my notes. Of course, I can quickly go through them. Uh, relational, not transactional. Meet people where they're at and place keeping, not place taking easy, right? But like what Jason had said is, it, it strikes me because I, you know, we were in the wake of the, the uprising and like George Floyd. And, you know, it, it, it asked, asked me like, what was my relationship to that, right? I'm a, I'm a Filipino. My parents are immigrants to Moore, Iowa. I moved up here. Minneapolis is my home, right? But started thinking, I live in Northeast Minneapolis, which isn't like one of the places that was like as active in everything. Everything wasn't burnt down. But then, you know, that absolved my neighborhood from participating in some kind of way. And I created a project. I hate to even call it a project. It was, an, it was a need. And my relationship to the thing is my, my neighbor, Terrence Franklin, when I moved into the neighborhood, directly across the street was murdered by the police, by six police officers in the basement of a South Minneapolis home. And you know the story. They, he went for a gun, blah, 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 right? Like, but we know he died by the hands of the police, and I didn't do anything after that, right? Like, and that was a just... Anyway, this project was about, like, George Floyd worked here, Terrence Franklin lived here, um, you know, Dante Wright went to school here, and it was in my neighborhood, right? So you got to think about your relationship. Even though you feel like it's far away... It's in South Minneapolis. It's at George Floyd Square. Your relationship to place is very important, and it, your relationship isn't that far from that person. So um, just bringing it back to the one-to-one -one and making it less transactional. Beautiful. Please join me in uh, thanking our, our, our panelists. Uh, we are. Uh, we certainly can take some questions from the audience if um, folks have some. There are um, some folks in the audience with mics, so if you would raise your hand if you have some questions for the, the panelists, that would be amazing. Y here, yep. So I guess the main issue that I'm having with things that I'm working on is there is the 
interaction, which is the focus, and the intersection, which is the focus of what I do, but the transactional is so fundamental to everything, it's hard to get past it. And I just want to throw that out there. The transactional thing is the foundation of all the systems that's messing everything up, the, the capitalism and the parts of it. How have you, with you've got nonprofits, I know it, it's, I don't know, any, any thoughts on that problem? I, the, the, the bulwark of capitalism that holds empty properties, for example, in Uptown. What, how do you do, what do you do? I don't know how to answer I mean, that. so I, Jason. good, Jason. Yeah, yeah. So I, I have a finance, I have a finance degree, um, and I spent a long time understanding, or I spent a long time studying to understand that finance is a feeling. Um, the value that you assign to things is actually what it is, and the value that you assign to whatever it is um, is what's making you feel that way. So our intrinsic value in Crenshaw is exactly what we're trying to create in our project. We know our community is beautiful. We know it's high value. We know we created it. So all we're trying to do is make that be seen by everybody else. Now, what that does to people, that value, that feeling is what we're working with, right? Now, what's making people give to Destination Crenshaw or making people transact for Destination Crenshaw is that same value, right? Because they speculate on black creative capital and they make money off of it. What we're doing with that is flipping it and saying, you're not gonna make money off of us, you're actually gonna make our community what it is, right? And so I think it's really trying to understand and learn what is our relationship with capital how do we repair that relationship with capital? Because we don't have nothing else. <laughs> like, I got to use that capital to make it better because if I don't have that capital, what, we create a coin, right? Like, you know, so we got to use what we have in order to make it work. And then, oh, by the way, we need philanthropy to feel good about it because they got to keep giving because we're a nonprofit, right? Um, so, I mean, I, I think it's, understanding the constraints of what we've got as a nonprofit, but also trying to figure out how we change our feeling about it and be intentional around its investment. So if I can help community members feel better about taking support, that's why I'm on the SBA website, yeah. right? That is the only reason because ultimately it's not my capital, but if I can make you feel better about reaching out for support or reaching out for help, that's why I'm here. And, and practically, I think, you know, uh, our policymakers certainly could be doing more um, to actually hold uh, investors and those that don't live in our community who own a, a host of properties, holding them responsible, who leave properties dilapidated, who don't make the critical investments and sit on that something in hopes that they're going to be able to turn and make a profit off of it. And so one of the one of the levers, and I think that we have to exercise this. What are, what are the policies that are in place that actually hold um, these landlords accountable? The last thing I'll put up to this is um, right following George Floyd's murder, I launched a CDC Justice Built Communities, bought a host of properties along West Broadway, most of which the landlords a one landlord was in Australia, the other one was uh, out somewhere, and we actually had to pay a premium to unlock those properties. Um, oh yeah. And so, but we knew it was so important um, to put it back in, you know, in the hands of a community-based organization and ultimately thinking about what is the kind of co-op model or um, some sort of shared model of ownership with community. And the sad thing is that, and they knew at that moment that they could ask for it, but I think our government, uh, our city could have come in in, in, a, in a way to help subsidize, to help mitigate that. And we were in a fortunate position to raise the philanthropic dollars to actually make make that purchase. But most people don't have that kind of liquidity to do it. And so, therefore, mm -hmm. it just sits there because he knows that, you know, uh, th that at some point someone from Colorado is going to want to buy it. And then so, because <laughs> that was the actual, we were outbidding someone from Colorado who actually wanted the car wash on West Broadway. 
And we had to come to them with the narrative of why it was so important to sell it to us so that it would stay in community. And so um, these, these land trusts and other entities that can get established to do this, but ultimately it's gonna, it, it's gonna take capital and it's gonna take some policies. Other questions in the audience? Felicia? I sort of have questions. Yes, comment too, because you, you too are an expert. I want you to make a comment. Yeah. Uh, you can. You want me to pull a chair up here? You on the panel now? <laughs> Maybe I'll be on the next panel, dear. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, this is such a great conversation. I find myself when. Um, thank you so much. Uh, was it Jason, the brother who's on yeah. the screen? Yeah. Um, and then, God. Wit and Scott. I know Wit's name. Was Scott. it Scott? Because I was going to call you Scott, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> okay. Um, I really appreciate when we get. Um, insight and for me um, affirmation around things I've been a dare you know like sometimes yelling at our policymakers our philanthropy around like we need to do this as was already mentioned there's a light rail project coming through my community um, my home in which I'm the only homeowner in my family uh, for several generations here um, is at threat you know my family's at threat of displacement I've been holding on tight to this house for 13 years um, because it's like the only tool for wealth building that exists in my family right now and so um, so this light rail's coming um, it's already negatively impacted the neighborhood. Um, it was supposed to go this other way and then it didn't and all those promises for infrastructure went away. And now that they've um, decided this new route, there is this huge gap in the community's um, awareness, uh, the community's understanding. Um, and what I notice in this moment while our policymakers and folks who have been in position to either make a plan, push for policy, and those type of things that hasn't been done yet, um, there's this big uh, lump of fear that I notice is being put into the community around the project. So folks are being pushed in this area of deciding like, no, do we stop it or do we just kind of passively let it happen? And to me, it really does a disservice to the intellect um, the power within the people in the neighborhood to actually make a decision and choose if they were informed enough. Or like you mentioned, hearing that you all are working on the training like years before this park is built. And I've been saying like, hey, so like none of us are gonna get the job on the light rail because none of us are prepared yet. Like yeah. if it's gonna be built in the next like five years, I don't have time to like <laughs> get a degree. And then also the jobs that come from this shouldn't just look like, you know, I'm gonna work on the train. like. How do we prepare people to have the job on the project team? Like it would have been really valuable to have some of our artists and architects, because they do live in our community or from our community, like actually be on the project team versus like get $10,000 in engagement money to come up with the physical models that the project team didn't come up with, right? Okay, so what does this have to do with all of this? <laughs> Everything, yeah. I am a North Sider. I am in the most one of the most, it's the community everybody talks about, all of the, the gaps, um, I've come from houselessness. You know, I was, uh, <laughs> we were homeless until like halfway through uh, high school, uh, what was it, senior high, my senior year in high school at Henry High School in North Minneapolis. I'm a graduate of there. You know, I've lived on or uh, near West Broadway for the majority of the 40, about 40 years that I've been um, here in Min Minneapolis. And I know all of these things, right? I can talk super intelligibly. I am not often welcome in the rooms that I'm in talking about this. Um, I face uh, intimidation. I've had threats to my life, y'all, um, serving on committees and having particular jobs at organizations and stuff. And yet, like, I feel like I'm at this point where I feel like I need to move, but now I'm like super inspired by th this conversation. Like, okay, like, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe there's another chance, maybe, maybe I can, be a place maker, or not, not a place maker, but a place keeper here in my own community. It's just that like, Felicia, I don't- you running for office right now? You're announcing <laughs> right now? No, I am not because, you know, I grew up seeing that folks in those positions are not um, uh, affecting the change. They're not caring about the things that I care about particularly. 
Um, you know, I can have conversations with my city council person about this light rail, which I have for the last couple years, like even some of them one-to-ones, some for my job, some for me like as a resident. And like even there, there's this, um, there's this gap sometimes in like understanding because just because they're a council person doesn't mean they understand development. Um, I currently work in the development world, which like I just, we are so behind. It makes me super sad to travel somewhere like DC or Texas or Alaska. I work for a com commercial land trust, okay? And still have not been engaged by the project team around how like from my position in my job, I can actually work with them to like scoop up these vacant properties, yeah. take them out of speculative and, and all of that. But there's this thing where like, <laughs> where like how do we value a person like me who has, um, is in the position I'm in, not because I chose this as a career choice. It's all been out of like necessity and survival. Like I needed to be in these jobs, in these positions to make something different for me and my children. So anyway, I don't know if there was a question in there, but that's but, what I had oh, to offer. No, your context is extremely helpful. Why are you giving so the mic, I think, Jason? So I think, <laughs> I think um, you just showed what true intrinsic value is um, and why translating that intrinsic value externally and showing it outside of our bodies is a process of repair, right? You know what's happening. How many times in black community do we know what's going to happen? It's it's like the it's like the character in a scary movie. We know the one that's going to die first every time. Everybody in the in the movie theater is like, "See, I told you!" Right? That is what we're doing as a community, right? And instead of having the scary movie happen, we're saying, "No, I'm going to change the ending." So what you're saying is, is that as an organizer, which you are clearly, because what you just did, um, you're going to start the march that our council member, when he was a community leader, did is say, OK, the trains happen. That's a constraint. Now that we know that, what else do we want to create? What else do we do? I'm going to call this guy Scott that I saw and I'm going to figure out what they've done and then I'm going to do it. Yeah, right now, yeah, yeah. right? Because I want to stay. Because ultimately, what moves Black people out of the community is a resignation. Is a resignation of not having the information and the access to do anything about the change that's happening. And so that nation starts years before they actually move, right? And so what this conversation is, it's no coincidence, because there are none. It's a way for you not to resign to moving, right? It's a way for you to actually know and understand and trust that you're right. And then now you move forward, right? And they'll make you run for office in the future, <laughs> right? But right now, you just create the change and, and, and trust what you see. Beautiful. And, Please, Scott. And I'll also say, because there are no coincidences, um, the we've actually just, just last week, um, I got the final version of our, we're piloting a larger national curriculum for this community leadership empowerment workshop. Just got it last week. So um, come see me afterwards. I'd love to share that with you. Um, and there's also a... Um, you know, we've um, the and I'll share this with you too. But we have created this larger um, seven-step process of how to how to how to engage a community to then come up with these strategies to make sure that local residents can stay and not survive but thrive in place. Right? Those strategies are going to look different in Minneapolis as they are in like D.C. But the process of engaging your community that's what's replicatable, right? And you know, and finally, I meant what I said before. Like, you know, we're we're here. Like, right? Um, yeah. The so yeah. um, please see me afterwards during the reception. Like Scott. Yeah. Like Scott is the real deal. He answers the phone. He answers texts. Um, you know, I, I can I can validate that as a 25 year old staffer of an organization that he didn't know me. Right. Like I wasn't in the meeting talking. Um, and, you know, I think that is how you know um, that people are actually able to do it. Right. Um, and, and I love what she said around like following her just passion and, and purpose, right? Because I had a p great person who uh, luckily I saw again this weekend told me, uh, a black woman, she told me this. She said, Jason, you're, you need to turn around. Fly with the wind, hmm. right? And when she said that, it immediately made me think, I gotta trust my gut. Yeah. 
Like all the things that I'm doing now, I'm like, they feel hard. They feel like I don't fit. Uh, no, just do what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. Um, and so it led me to leaving nonprofit uh, affordable housing advocacy, going to infrastructure, trusting a friend and a mentor that tells me that this is the boss I need, working, taking a huge pay cut, but ultimately learning infrastructure in a way that would have never been able, I would have never been able to do it otherwise. And then hear about Destination Crenshaw, meet a person with that old boss, and then all of a sudden I'm here talking to you today, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm lucky to get that advice, uh, to be able to reinforce and, and, a, and affirm that whoever is proud that made that statement, you are beyond correct. Um, so please trust it. I will make sure the two of you are connected. Um, so uh, per, um, perhaps one way, and I'll invite uh, the folks from the walker up, but as, as they come up, you know, this, this panel's been curated intentionally, and as you will notice that there has been not been any politicians recovering politicians uh, and reco some recovering civil servants because we've recognized where the power sits and it is in community it is uh, the, I said this in the last one but the preamble was written where the power sits we the people and so it is the activation of folks that come to these kinds of meetings and conversations that we believe can usher the type of change that our city um, seeks and so hopefully you are all equally as expire, inspired as um, Felicia has been this evening. One last and final question, and then we will, um, the folks from the Walker, if you want to. Megan, are you taking? OK. And this team will be, um, after they take a quick breath, um, we'll meet you in the lobby. But please, ma'am. Thank you. Just a quick question for Scott. Scott, I found some of your approaches very insightful because you talk about systemic change. And I'm a fourth generation Minnesotan. I'm uh, curious about what you said about consensus. If you could expand on how you build consensus across multiple uh, constituents and also uh, diverse stakeholders. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's become that's a really great question. I think it's really critical that, and I'm going to say something that's very obvious, but it's important to state a community does not speak with one voice, right? And there's, um, but a community needs to have the opportunity to be heard. Right, and that's that's critical, right? Um, I remember as we were going through our larger, we, we pulled together as we were doing our design competition, this group of community stakeholders, um, sort of key folks who we knew needed to be engaged with, with the project, and you know what? They didn't all get along, right? Um, the, but they had an opportunity to be heard, right? They had the opportunity, they had the, a platform to share their concerns, right? Um, the, and discuss it, right? And hopefully uh, in a, um, facilitated and moderated and sort of civil discourse, right? So this, um, the, but we also need to be really clear of who's showing up in the room and who isn't showing up in the room, right? Because often, and, and how do we, and again, this is an obvious thing, but how do we make sure that we're removing as many barriers as we can for that participation, right? So this simple things like making sure that there's food and there's childcare. And most importantly, that we're, we're, when we're asking when we're asking for the deep rich knowledge that is in the community that we're compensating them for that right I would never ask for a, a facilitator to come down from New York and work for free but that's what we ask for the community all the time right so we pay right like we pay when we have a group of coming in for uh, our equitable development strategies leaders in the arts and culture community we make sure that like we build that into our budget that's really key so making sure we're being really intentional every time we have these meetings it's the you know like a dare mentioned right at the beginning it's like who's not in the room and how do we make sure that well then there's not youth here how do we make sure like what is that strategy to get youth right um it's really critical so anyways quick answer but i, I don't want to delay you all from continuing the conversation so i just want to say thank you to the folks in this room especially those on our stage and uh beaming in from LA. You've given us so much uh, to discuss and to think about and to act on, and so I hope that you will. Um, you can join us up in the lobby just behind. There's a bar set up if you'd like. Um, these folks will take a quick breather and join us up there. Thank you. Oh, take the survey, please.